Welcome back. Karin Phillips, we are joined here by one of the best front office free agents on the market. He can go into the media free agency. He can go back into the NBA front office of free agency. He probably have to sign some non-disclosure agreements for all the secrets that he spilled. <laughs> Amin El Hassan. Amin, what is going on, brother? What's going on, Vinny? Karin, what's, what's the word, man? This is, it feels good to be free, just to uh, inhale and know that I can <laughs> stay whatever the hell I want. Get get your get your shots off, but I'm very curious because you know we we had Kevin Durant who escaped from Golden State, and uh, my friend Karen Phillips here believes that this year is supposed to be the year that we find out how good Stephen Curry is. I think that is utter and complete nonsense. I'm curious, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think we already know how good he is. He's a two-time MVP. He's the only unanimous MVP in the history of the game. Audio. And, and he did all of that. He did all of that before Kevin Durant ever set foot in Golden State. So I think we all know how good Stephen Curry is. Really, what we're realizing is, hey man, it's really hard to win games when uh, everyone after Draymond Green pretty much is someone who hasn't played for a winning franchise. And, and this Warriors team is really young. They're still trying to get to know this offense. Even the guys that were here last year. They're still trying to get to know the beats and rhythms of playing with Steph Curry and playing with Draymond Green and that it's taking time. But I'll tell you what, if you watch them from the first week of the season till now, it's definitely a different team. Yeah, they look different. It looks like Steph is being able to handle the double teams a lot better. They're starting to sort of break him loose in the early offense. Like he's, I think he's understanding that the first shot he's going to get is probably the best shot. But even then, do you think that the makeup of this team makes them a little more dangerous coming down the road? Or is this team just what they are going to be, you know, with Andrew Wiggins, with Kelly Oubre, with James Wiseman, all these guys being wild cards? And you add in Draymond Green, who's not the scorer, uh, the secondary scorer that maybe Kyrie, that, that maybe Stephen Curry would need. How do you see this long-term outlook for these guys? Yeah, for, for this year, honestly, a playoff berth is probably as good as they can hope for. Uh, it, these guys are just too inexperienced. Even the guys who've been in the league for a while, just too inexper inexperienced to rely upon for this team to be any greater than just a playoff team. You said Steph's trying to figure out that the first shot is usually the going to be the best shot. That's not because the defense gets harder as the possession goes on. It's because he's used to, I give up this shot, I pass it, and I'm going to run this way, and I'm going to relocate somewhere else, and I'm going to get it back. But he's playing with guys that don't know that, or at least are not as top of mind about it as, you know, two or three years ago when he's playing with Andre Iguodala and Sean Livingston and Clay Thompson and all these other guys who know how to play. So the reality is, this season is pretty much going to be an education, an education for James Wiseman, first and foremost, because he's the guy that's probably going to last the longest out of this group, but also Andrew Wiggins and, and Oubre and Wanamaker and all these other names, because they really don't know how to play Warriors basketball yet. Now, whether they get the hang of it as the season goes on, that's going to be something to watch. I'm Carl, happy you, you said Warriors basketball, but... I, like I'm happy it means uh, Warriors basketball because the, the question I have about that franchise, not just this team and what this season will be, is I'm looking five, six, seven years down the line. And, yeah, you know, we, we, we think James Wiseman will probably be the focal point on the new young face of that team. But the thing that comes to my mind is, look, they're, they're, we know what they are this year. What they could be next year, we'll see. But what's going to happen when that team is not as good as they've been or in that new arena with that new rich and bougie fan base that's not going to give them that lift they used to have like the fans in Oakland used to do every night, even when they was terrible. I just have an idea that in like six, seven years, if everything ain't sweet like it has been in the past, it's going for the Warriors, that that new fans arena might be a little lonely and attendance might go down. And I'm crazy for thinking this way, or do y'all feel the same as well? Well, I'm going to say this, Karn. It might be empty if the prices stay the way they were. There's a reason why it was always <laughs> packed. It's because it was cheap. Like, you could as up until recently, you could be a family in Oakland and take you and the, and the significant other and the kids to a game. And I'm not saying it was like back in the day it was $10 a ticket, but like within reason. 
And what happened was when they started winning, uh, Vinny, you know this, because we were going to the finals every year. And that first finals, it was loud and crazy and raucous. And by the end, it was the wine and cheese crowd. That wasn't a building that yep. changed. It was the same address, but the price point pushed all the quote-unquote real mm. fans out and brought in the wine and cheese crowd, the Silicon Valley crowd, the people who were here to stunt. I got court seat, the courtside seats at the Warriors game, not because they really love watching James Michael McAdoo and Patrick McCall and, like, you know, the, the <laughs> deep knowledge of a real fan like that. So, Karn, you're right in the extent that they priced out the regular fan, and it'll be interesting to see in a couple of years that expensive building that they, they, you can't really just drop the prices the way you can in a regular arena. I don't know if either of you guys have toured that building. It's amazing, but it looks expensive. Yeah, that no, was the I, thing. Like, I, I went I there on the tour during to the see finals. It yet. Yeah, and everything no, I've I read went... about it is like this was a building for like concerts. And this is a venue where you can have things in. And the, the fancy stuff they have in the boxes, in the suites, like somebody will come, you know, get, you, get your measurements for a suit while you're watching the game. So, yeah, yeah. If, if this is long term for the city and you want all this other money, cool. But you got this building because of basketball. And if the basketball ain't sweet and the fans ain't coming who really want to support this team because it's too expensive, and the expensive fans with the money don't want to come because this isn't a cool thing to do anymore, what do you mm -hmm. do? Because this is a fan base that has always had fans that kept them relevant and was always loved. And since you've turned your back on Oakland pretty much, like I'm just worried about the, what the Warriors look like in the future when all the things that made them lovable are gone, potentially. All right, so this is what I'll say. Every NBA team, you're always dealing with a life cycle, right? You're always dealing with, hey, mm -hmm. we had a star now, we had a great time, and then the star wants out or leaves or whatever. So the idea that six years from now, I can tell you that Steph Curry will still be playing in a Warriors uniform, I'd be lying, right? I don't know. Nobody knows that. But I do know that if he is still playing as, in a Warriors uniform, this guy has a game that's going to age well. And it's on Bob Myers and that front office with Kirk Lacob and, uh, and now Sean Livingston and Zaza Pachulia in there as well. It's on them to continue to find the complimentary talent that's going to keep this thing going. And a beautiful thing is you got Wiseman. He can be your cornerstone for the future. You also got a first-round pick from Minnesota coming this year that we expect is going to yes, be do. pretty high in a great draft. That's another guy that can come in, and, and you're seeing the building blocks for whatever is next. But, you know, who, for all I know, Steph might leave in a couple of years, and Clay might retire, and Draymond might get traded. And you're right, it might be James Wiseman and a bunch of scrubs. But, you know, it's, it's too hard to say that right now, what's going to happen six years from now. It's, it, look, it, it's a hard to say what's going to happen six days from now if you're in Brooklyn with the Nets and your, and your old co-worker, <laughs> Steve Nash, you know, from Phoenix. Like, tell me this, I mean, does Steve Nash have the demeanor to be able to handle all of the machinations and let's just say it, the needs of a Kyrie Irving and a James Harden and a Kevin Durant? Not just who's the adult in charge, but who's on whose couch? Because this seems like team therapy right now. Yeah. No, Vinny, I'm, I'm going to tell you like this. I don't know if there's anyone who's equipped to, quote, unquote, handle Kyrie Irving at this point. I mean, we're seeing levels of kind of behavior that are, you know, in a league where everything has been done before, I can honestly say I've never seen the one where the guy said, yeah, I didn't feel like playing. Right? That, that was a new one for me, too. But having said that, uh, to be fair, I think that if there were anybody in the world, particularly even of the, the coaching candidates that were available when they made this decision to hire Steve, Steve is the most qualified, and here's why. I'm, we can only assume that Kyrie is upset about things that are happening around in the world, particularly what happened in, in the Capitol last week. If you want to talk about a guy, a superstar player, who's dealt with real-world issues and speaking out for it, you don't have to look much farther than Steve Nash. He's the MVP of the league, and he stood up at a time when it wasn't popular for athletes to give non-athlete speak answers to real-world issues. And he said, this war in Iraq is wrong. This invasion in Iraq is wrong. We are doing the wrong thing as a country. And that was a decision that, remember, it was a bipartisan decision. Democrats and Republicans were both, rah, 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 let's go into Iraq. Steve Nash stood up in a red state and said, that ain't right, and took the heat but he also showed up for work every day. 
He also balled the hell out. And so if there's anybody in the world who can understand where Kyrie might be feeling, I would say it's Steve Nash. He's the absolute right man for the job. Having said that, some jobs can't be done. <laughs> so are you saying Steve Nash? So, so does Steve Nash deserve a raise just for the uh, therapy sessions he might be giving his team so far with their I new think, pieces? I'm going to say this. My guy, Sean Marks and those guys, they got a great benefits package. He's not coming out of pocket on any of, the, <laughs> any of that therapy. <laughs> they got it covered. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I am I am curious. The one thing I've always said about the James Harden situation is that people forget that if a player acts up on the way out and it gives a bad, it gives this bad stench about a player acting a fool and he goes to the next team, nobody cares. Jimmy Butler acted a fool in Minnesota and, t and basically made it televised. Anthony Davis acted a fool in New Orleans and they were both in the finals, the toast of the town, and nobody cared. Do you think the same situation is going to be in the case with James Harden? Vinny, I'm gonna add a name to that. Remember Charles Barkley acting a fool in Philadelphia? Of course you don't. You just remember the Suns <laughs> went to the finals and Chuck was MVP. And this <laughs> is, that's what I meant about Kyrie. This is something I haven't seen before. Well, James did? Yeah, I've seen this plenty of times throughout the history of the league. Superstars don't like where they are. They say it nicely, hey, I would like you to trade me. The team says, sure, don't worry, he's fine. We'll convince him, we'll, he's, he's showing up, he's all right, he's playing great. They do all this stuff. And I tell players all the time, if you made up your mind, you don't wanna be here anymore, at some point you're gonna have to stop being professional, you're gonna start having to act a fool. And you don't, this isn't because you're petulant or whiny or whatever, it's because they're not taking you seriously every time you show up and as if nothing's wrong. It's just like being in a relationship with someone. At some point when you want to break up and they don't get all the hints, you have to grab them and say, I don't want to be with you. And that's what James Harden did in that press conference the other night. He said, I've done everything I can do here. I can't do no more. This isn't a good team. Get me out of here. And I don't think it's any coincidence. The next day he got traded. Well, I think he got traded the next day because uh, if he got allowed into that locker room, DeMarcus Cousins and John Wall was going to be waiting on him. <laughs> But that's why you don't hold on to these guys. That's why when the guy says, I don't want to be here, you don't say we can convince him. All he's going to do is ruin the chemistry. Now, some people do it passive aggressively like James Harden did. Some people do it aggressively aggressively like Jimmy Butler did. Jimmy Butler went right at every single dude and cussed out the front office and then went and did a sit down with Rachel Nichols afterwards. That's Jimmy Butler's way of doing it. James Harden's not that kind of personality. So what's he going to do? He shows up. He plays some lackluster defense. He comes to the press conference after it's like, yeah, we lost because we're not good enough. And I'm going to say all the things that are toxic, but it's really the same strategy that Jimmy Butler employed. And I'm not, I say this not to castigate them. I say it because I understand because if you're nice and you're professional and you do your job and you work hard, they won't take your request seriously. See, this is what I was talking about yeah. earlier. You missed it. I mean, when I was like, I can understand Harden. Now, do I agree with what he did? But I can, I can understand it because there was a job a long time ago where I tore off my uniform and I kicked the front door and I stormed out because I wasn't being taken seriously. And there were some issues with management. So, yes, I feel James Harden. But, bro, we too old for that. You got, you got to do yeah. it a different way. But what he said you know, in that only... press conference, it ain't like he was, it ain't like he was lying. Yeah. Yeah, the only difference, Karn, I would say, the part that I have a problem with what he did is that the whole world tour, I'm going out and partying, and I'm not wearing a mask, and I'm around other yeah. people not wearing masks. That's where yeah. it goes outside of basketball. Forget about sports. Forget about what you feel about the Rockets. We live in a pandemic. You have to take this seriously. Yeah. And, and that was the part that was disappointing. But if this were a regular season and he had done that, I'd be like, man, let me know. I'm going to pull up. You know, yeah, or, and, and or you know what? Point, it's not so much that it's not so point, not so much that, that we know we we know NBA guys or in NFL and every league go out and party and do things like that. It wasn't that James was in Atlanta. It's that James got caught on Instagram in Atlanta. If you gonna move like that, at least move in a way where it's not no camera phones around, so somebody can't post you and have you going live. So as soon as you're in the spot, no. your bosses and the team owner and your teammates know what you're doing. You gotta move with some type of stealth if you're gonna be out here in the streets acting up in a now, pandemic. Karn, 
That wasn't no accident, though. That wasn't no accident. You do that because you want it out. <laughs> I, wa I want my significant other to see me out with a strange woman on my lap and another one around her. I, I want her to see it so she knows I don't want to be with you anymore. <laughs> That's how you let her know. You, you do it have, yourself. Ha have you had some... Have you had some Marcus Graham days in your life, uh, Amin Al Hassan, where you're trying to escape from a relationship because she got bad feet or something like that? She got hammer time on her feet, and you trying to escape, and she not getting the picture because 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 you you speaking with a lot of a, a lot of heat from experience. It seems like. Mar yeah, man, talk to us. Get, get it off your chest. <laughs> No, man, no, I, I just speak strictly from the professional angle of working in. the front office and seeing players who want to get traded and not get traded I, I i know how it goes i've seen it time and time again and i used to be on the other side why is the dude acting up why did I, and then i realized the only reason you a fire was lit to get him out of here was because you felt like this dude was bringing toxicity into our locker room and once you feel that and that's confirmed as an organization you have to remove it one way or another Nothing says anti-toxic like Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and James Harden being on the same damn team in the same <laughs> locker room. That just screams out healthy relationships. Welcome to the NBA coaching world, Steve Nash. Amin El Hassan, Sirius XM, Dan Levitar Radio. Appreciate you for your time as always, my man. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good weekend. Hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.